2022. Can you believe it? I'll tell you what, you made it. You made it through 2021 and you lived to tell about it. So at the very least, at the absolute minimum, that's something to be proud of. You are here. If you have breath in your lungs, you made it. There is no getting around it. 2020 and 2021 were brutal. They were brutal. In fact, a lot of us felt like we were in a boxing match with Ivan Drago, right? I was Blake you. Or maybe this guy right here. Anybody know who this is? I will give you a quarter if you can tell me who that is. Anybody know? Don't feel bad if you don't, because I didn't either. Who said it? Yes, Pastor Bill. Of course, Pat. He knows Pastor Bill. John L. Sullivan will go down in history as probably the greatest boxer of all time. If you're not familiar with him, and I wasn't either, he went 50 and 0. 50 and 0. 50 undefeated bouts. He was the world champion bare knuckle boxing expert for 49 fights. Then he went 50th and he became the first heavyweight champion of gloved boxing. Until one day, he stepped into the ring with this guy right here on September 7th, Gentleman Jim Corbett, a good Christian young man, entered the ring with arguably the undefeated champion of the world, and he beat Sullivan. Gentleman Jim Corbett did the unthinkable and knocked him out. Now, what do you think? Second round? Fifth round? Maybe he took it all the way to 12. No, no, no. Nay, I say to thee, 21st round knockout. I mean, can you imagine? If you've ever sparred, if you've ever done karate, it is tough. You guys know, right? I mean, it's like after two minutes, you are absolutely flat out exhausted. But it's, it's so cool because gentleman Jim Corbett had a four-word motto. Just four simple words. You might want to write it down. He said this, fight one more round. Just fight one more round. Don't worry about the end. Don't worry about 21 rounds. Just fight. The, in, in other words, just take the next step. If you're tired, fight one more round. If you're discouraged, fight one more round. Don't worry about the big picture. Just take the next step. If you're home and you're sick, maybe you're fighting the Carolina crud and the flu or the COVID, fight one more round. If you're in the hospital, I know my mom's back in the hospital. She's going to have surgery tomorrow for a broken back. Mom, if you're watching, hang in there. Fight one more round. It is an incredible motto that actually has its basis in Scripture. The Apostle Paul said this. He says, I have fought the good fight. Think about that. I've kept the faith. I've finished what you gave me to do. As gentleman Jim Corbett said, check this out. He says, when your arms are so tired that you can hardly even lift your hands to bring them up to guard, fight one more round. When your nose is bleeding and your eyes are black and blue and they're almost shut and you're so tired that secretly you're wishing your opponent would just pop you on the jaw so you would go to sleep, fight one more round. Because the man who fights one more round is never beaten. And there it is. For a world that is tired, for a world that cannot wait to turn the page to 2022. This is it. This is what he is saying to us. If you feel like these last couple years have taken a toll on you, they probably have. If you're more tired than usual, don't be discouraged. It is a season. Fight one more round. This too shall pass. Here's the lesson. I love how Mark Batterson put it. He said this. He says, don't be in such a hurry to get out of your current circumstances that you don't get anything out of them. Read that again. Y'all, this is us. How many times have you God, get me out of this season? Get me through this. I want to rush through the pain because I want to get to the other side, right? That's normal. We all do that. But don't go so fast that you get nothing out of it and this season is wasted. Learn the lesson. Cultivate that change. Embrace that. Don't give up. Fight one more round. Paul would give us this advice. If we're starting the new year, continue to fight the good fight. As we fight one more round, how do we do that? How do we carry on? How do we make these days really count this year more than any other? Have you ever heard the phrase, redeem the time? Redeeming the time, right? Yeah, you've heard of it. Because it is from Scripture. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes this. He says this. See then that you walk circumspectly. You know what that means? That means pay careful attention. Walk not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time. There it is. Because the days are evil. That's so blunt. 
Do we say that? That's not even politically correct. You can't call the days evil. This is what the scriptures say. Read on. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Paul is saying our response to being a follower of Christ, our response to the gospel is to redeem our time, to manage these days as carefully and as wisely as possible. The Greek word used here is exagorazo. It's an incredibly powerful word that carries with it this meaning of redeeming, to buy up or to pay the ransom for your time. So if you've ever said, I wish I had more time or I wish I could buy more time, this is the idea Paul's talking about here. Right? As Christians, we are called to buy up, to redeem as much time as we can. Here's a real life story of how this, this plays out. You, you all can identify. Back when Amy and I were newlyweds, I was the pastor of youth and worship. That's a terrible combination. They got nothing to do with each other, but that's what they did. And I was doing that. We were newlyweds. I think I was 19, maybe 20 years old. Amy was 19. Here's a picture of us. It's just young in love. Way too eager for stuff. And we decided after a week of missions and back to our Bible clubs and BBS, how do we reward these 45 youth? Well, we load them up and we drive from Tennessee to Atlanta, of course, and we go to Atlanta Fest. We spend two or three days there and we do some all-nighters there and we have a great time at Six Flags. <sighs> all right, now remember, we're 18, 19, 20 years old. The youth we're taking are 17, 18, 16, 15. We're like right there. And we're like, we, we're the ones in charge at this point. I, I keep like, what were we thinking? What were we thinking? Like, I'm, the adult should have been walking in. It wasn't us. And we're sitting there, we're in the park, and like, this is how, this is how laid back it was in the early 90s. We're like, all right, 45 youth, y'all go. I'll see you at the gate at midnight, all right? Just go do your thing, check it, right? Because we were so exhausted. And they were too. And we were, just, we were walking up these hills, and at Six Flags, it felt like it was a mountain. I remember, and we were young, we were in shape, man. We had it going on. It wasn't like we were like, ugh, fat and ugly. We were sitting here walking up in these, and I looked, and I saw this room, and it said, parents, rest stop. And I'm like, Praise the Lord. Well, you look, it was a false advertising. It was where you go to pick up your kid if your kid got lost, right? A parent exchange, one of those things. And I looked at Amy, and we both had the same thought. Parent exchange, kid exchange. I said, I wonder if there's a cot in there that we can just lay. I will pay $100 if I could just lay down in a dark room for 15 minutes. You know, I will pay $500 if I could just go in a dark room, curl up in the fetal position for an hour. Right? We thought it was such a good idea. Like if we, that's the thought. I, I think about that. I was like, ah, if I could buy time, I would spend any amount. If you're fighting for your health, you would spend any amount to buy another week, to buy another hour, another meal with your kids. Think, this is what he's saying. He's saying, guys, it is so serious as Christians. We are called to redeem the days every day. Not so we have more time to spend on selfish desires. It's so we can advance the kingdom. Why? Because he says the days are evil, meaning we are running out of time. The time is fleeting. Does anybody remember Jack Bauer? Remember the show on 24? Oh, my goodness. We made the mistake. A friend told us about six seasons in, you need to watch 24. This dude is so, anybody know the actor's name? Kiefer Sutherland, Sutherland right? Yes, that's right. So he, this dude is so intense. And this show is all about time. It is a literal 24-hour, it's filmed in real time, and every minute, is, and there's a clock always going, ching 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 and you go into commercials, right? And you hear it, and it just hammers it in. We binge-watched all 24 hours of season one, straight into two, into season Y'all, it almost killed us. We were sitting, I like had a twitch. It messed with my head. I was so, I would hear the doorbell ring. I'm like, what's going on? Who's, right? It just... It freaks you out because you are so into 20. He is so intense. He's like good cop, bad cop, all in one guy. Like one minute, he is shouting, you are running out of time. And you believe him. And in the next minute, he's got this smoldering gaze where you look into his eyes and he says, you are running out of time. And you believe him. Look into his eyes. You believe him too, right? I don't even know what we're running out of time for, but I'm in. I believe him. Sign me up, Kiefer. I'm in. We'll go, right? Y'all, why? Because I take him seriously. We should take the scripture just as seriously as we take a fake Jack Bauer. He says we are running out of time. Our time is fleeting. We should make the most of it. So you know I've got to ask, how are you doing with that? 
How are you doing with redeeming your days? It's a tough question. How are you doing with redeeming your time? Is it on selfish pursuits? Just things that we're just, just going through the motions? Or can you look back in 2021 and point to something you did to advance the kingdom? It's a challenging question. How do we redeem the time? The best way to answer that is to look at the author of time. Look at the one who created time, the one who managed his time so awesome when he came to earth in the person of Jesus. As you read the Gospels, you can't help but realize Jesus was absolutely the most productive person who ever lived. Think about it. He had the weight of the world. He knew what his vision was when he came down. So I want to look at his life and how he managed his time. It was so countercultural, y'all. I mean, it's just, and we're going to apply these principles to our own lives to make us followers of Christ in 2022 for the next couple weeks. But today we're going to focus on Luke chapter 8. So if you want to turn that, I'm going to read from the New King James and a little bit from the CSB. Luke chapter 8. And we're going to see how Jesus is the ultimate example to redeeming the time. Starting in verse 22 of chapter 8, he says this. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and they set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. That's Jesus. A squall, okay, that's a gully washer for those of you who don't know what that is. A squall came down on the lake so intense that the boat was being swamped. And they were in great danger. Okay, Not mild danger, not moderate danger great danger. So it's real. So the disciples, remember, they're out there on the lake. They're enjoying this quiet boat ride. They're having a great time. They're fishing. They're drinking their virgin pina coladas. They're having a great time. And then Jesus falls asleep and the bottom drops out. It spirals out of control. So bad that they're bailing water, right? Faster than it could come in. Imagine how discouraging. They're, they're, they're bailing the water out and they look and it is literally being swamped. That's what swamped is. The water's coming in over the edge faster than they can deal with it. That sounds a lot like us, by the way. Some of you with your to-do list that are never ending. This is us. Can you identify? So the disciples are freaking out, and there's only one thing to do. Recognizing that they can't calm the chaos on their own, they wake up Jesus. The Prince of Peace. What's he doing? He's sleeping. Just sleeping. Just having a little nappy nap. And it's rocking and rolling, and the wind's blowing. You know there's thunder and light. It's going crazy. And they wake him up and beg him for help. Look at what they say, verse 24. Keep reading. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. And he got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Isn't that awesome? All right, so the very first point I want you to hear in 2022, we get this from this passage, is this. Jesus offers you peace before you do anything. Jesus offers you peace before you do anything. Write that down, because this is radical. This flies in the face of what our culture tells us. See, our culture constantly throws at us a workspace productivity, doesn't it? If you do X, Y, and Z, then you'll be able to rest and find peace. That's not what Scripture says. That is contrary. The Scripture gives you grace-based productivity, which says already through Jesus you have victory, you have peace. Now we do X, Y, and Z as a response to him. And it can even be, wait for it, an offering of worship. Again, look at the disciples in the swamp boat. Notice this. The disciples didn't do anything to calm the chaos. Did you catch that? Because I missed that the first time I read it. All they did was merely trust Jesus to calm the storm. How awesome is that? And you and I are allowed to do the same thing by trusting in Jesus first for the forgiveness of sins. We now have peace with God. That's Romans 5.1. We have this peace. From this peace, we are secure. Regardless, oh, you need to hear this, regardless of how productive or unproductive you are today. That peace is available to those who know Christ. Matt Perman, great author, he said this. He said, for the Christians, peace comes first, not second. The mistake we often make is to make peace of mind the result of things we do rather than from the source. All right, time management tactics are great. We'll talk about a few of those on Wednesday nights. We'll, 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 I'll give you some great tips for your, for your year, but they will never be your foundational source of peace. That is found in Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Our ultimate solution to being swamped is found in knowing and walking with the God-man who was asleep in the bottom of a boat in the middle of a storm. As the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 2.14, Jesus himself is our peace. All right, so now we've established that our place in God's family is secure, that that's where we find peace. How do we be better stewards of our time? 
What does scripture have to say about our role in it? Okay, I'm going to give you five rapid fire answers to that question and then we're done. Okay, five truths. The first one's this. Truth number one, our longing for timelessness is good and it's God given. That nagging feeling you have, that longing for timelessness, it's from God. It's in our DNA. We don't just long to live forever. We also long to be productive forever. <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't know about that, Pastor. I just want to go curl up in that fetal position like you at Six Flags and rest. Listen, obviously we don't necessarily feel like being productive every day because we live in a broken, fallen world. Because of that, sin has made work and our efforts to be productive, it's made it difficult. It's made it friction fraught. But something in our souls, you know this, Something in our souls, something in God's word tells us that our work was meant to be very good. We forget this. But look back in the very beginning. Look at Genesis, Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to what? To work it and to take care of it. You ready for a little, little uh, hidden goal? The Hebrew word used here for work is avoda. It is this incredible Hebrew word, which literally means to worship. It's translated as worship in so many Bibles. Remember, the idea of work existed before the fall. That means the idea of work existed pre-sin. Do you see where this is going? Uh, we don't like this. Remember, this idea of work was God's plan from the beginning, and it was originally good. In fact, he declared it very good. It was better than just good. Work was actually a form of worship. <laughs> so you know what i got to ask? Think about your job. When is the last time you bounded out of bed, kissed your honey goodbye, and said, baby, I'm off to another amazing day of worship? Oh, I mean work. Because they're so close, I get them mixed up. Think about that. Y'all, but before the fall, this is how God intended it. That changes our whole perspective. Our desire to live forever, to be productive forever, was designed by God himself. If you don't believe me, go, all, go Old Testament. Go to Ecclesiastes 3.11. It says God himself set eternity in our human heart. Something in our God-given DNA tells us we were made for something more. To be human now is to work with time. And our minds know that time is finite. But it's like our souls long for something infinite. Like time shouldn't be finite. Why is time not finite? Because of sin. Because of the fall. Which leads us to our next truth. Sin has now ensured we will all die with unfinished symphonies. The reason we choose the word symphonies here is very telling. You'll get to it in a second. When sin entered into the world, death was ushered in right behind it. It was whoosh. That's what happened. It came in, and we see this in Genesis 3, verse 17. Read with me. To Adam, God said, because you listened to your wife... Oh, Men do not take that in, out of context. I don't have to listen. Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil now, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. The ground will produce thorns and thistles for you. You'll eat the plants in the field. By the sweat of your brow will you eat your food until you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken. For dust you are, and dust you will return. Wow. That sounds pretty impressive. That's bleak. That's a huge statement. It's in the New Testament, too. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since death came through a man, that's Adam, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man, Jesus. So here's the deal. Because of the fall of man into sin, human beings, you and I, who were created to be immortal, are now mortal. Does that make sense? We were created to do work, which was good. Now work was cursed. It is going to become difficult because of us, because of our sin. Time, which was created to be infinite, was now finite. So in short, sin has ensured that every one of us will never finish all the work you envision completing in your life. Carl Rayner, one of the most prominent Catholic theologians of the 20th century, he speaks like C.S. Lewis. He said it this way. It's so deep. He says, in the torment of the insufficiency of everything attainable, we learn that ultimately, in this world, there is no finished symphony. That's depressing. <laughs> isn't, it? But isn't it true? Every one of us will die with unfinished business. Our to-do list, our to-do list, I'm going somewhere with this, will never be fully completed. 
because there will always be a gap between what we hope to get done and what we're able to accomplish with the days we have. And I know that sounds like I'm being Debbie Downer up here, but you know I always bring the good news. And from this step forward, we turn the page. Thankfully, sin does not get the final say, which leads us to truth number three. God will finish the work we leave unfinished. God is the great finisher, and I'm so grateful he will complete it. All right, so let's recap. God created us to live forever, but sin broke creation, made us mortal, time-bound, we're now finite. So where do we find hope? Our hope is found in the finished work of Jesus. It's not in what you do. It's not in what I do. It is in the finished work of Christ. He who began a good work is faithful to complete it. When he walked out of that tomb on that first Easter, he inaugurated a new kingdom. The resurrection of Jesus declared that our longing for immortality had been right all along. That longing that you know there's something more. Now, through him, we can experience eternal life. Okay? Death does not have the final say. That's our hope. But the lost world doesn't have that. Now do you see why they walk around angry and confused and hurting? But for the grace of God, there go us. That is us. All right, so how does this tie into redeeming our time? If you're new to the faith, here's the basic Christian story simplified. I'll sum it up in four sentences. God created us to live and work with him and enjoy his fellowship forever in a perfect paradise known as Eden. Okay? Sin messed everything up, so God promised to send a savior king that would set everything right. And he did. He did that in the form of Jesus. When Jesus defeated death on Easter, he proved emphatically beyond a shadow of doubt he is the promised savior king Messiah. Everything from that moment on through the end of Revelation 21, 22, is about him inaugurating his new kingdom until he returns again to make all things new. We see that in Revelation 21, 5, okay? So there's the cliff notes of scripture. Now, how does that affect us today in 2022? Look at 1 Corinthians. We see some clues from Paul. He says this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Okay, here it is. Fight one more round. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know your labor in the Lord is never in vain. All right, look at 1 Corinthians 3, 9. For we are co-workers in God's service. You're his field. You are God's building. Did you catch that? We are God's co-workers. That changes our whole perspective of what we're doing, why we got out of bed, why you came on a rainy day when it's threatening snow tomorrow when the apocalypse is coming. You came. You're so brave. Right? We made it. We're here in Genesis. God created a lot in six days. I love Genesis. That's what my master's degree was in. We're going to be talking about that coming up and, and seeing what these six days of creation was. I just, I love, you know, it is so remarkable what he created. But it is so fantastically mind-blowing what he didn't create. Think about it like this. The first few days of creation, God is setting up his canvas. Okay? He is Bob Ross, and he's setting it up, and he's doing his happy trees, and he's, oh, you made a mistake, we'll make this, right? And he's doing this incredible thing for six days. And it is phenomenal. But then he does something just mind-blowing. He stops, puts the paintbrush down, and he hands the baton to you. And he hands it to me. And he says, now you have a mandate. I want you to go be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, populate it with things that will point to his glory. That is your mandate. That's it from the, the original source. He is the OG here. The same thing happened again on Easter morning. This is so deep. Jesus inaugurated his kingdom with his resurrection. But he left the work of building his kingdom to us until he returns to complete the work he promised to finish. Does that make sense? All right, so here's where I'm going to drop the weekly truth grenade. And I hope this is incredibly mm, freeing to somebody, okay? This should be freeing. This should take the burden, the yoke off of your shoulders. God doesn't need you or me to finish our to-do list. You need to hear that. This is free. God doesn't need anything. He doesn't, he doesn't need, he, doesn't, he lacks for nothing. So he doesn't need you or me to finish our to-do list. If our, if, if our to-do list lines up with his to-do list, trust me, it will get done. He will complete it. If the things on our list are on God's list, he will complete them. With or without us. God's purposes will not be thwarted. So, if you want to go really deep, ultimately, truth number three is false. 
There's no such thing as an unfinished symphony. If God desires that symphony to be finished, if that is part of his eternal world, it will be completed. Whatever God wants finished, he will complete the good work. He will finish it, which leads us to another liberating truth. You and I have all the time we need to accomplish his desires. Think about that. This is so deep. I know. Some of you are like, oh, it's New Year. What are you doing? Way too much. All right. You and I have all the time we need, which takes us to truth number four. So powerful. The gospel is our source. It's our source of rest, and it's our source of ambition. This is what's supposed to motivate us. Remember, as we've seen, God doesn't need us to be productive. But if we're honest, we often need ourselves to feel productive. Some of you, the light just went on. You, you get this, right? We, in order for us to feel that sense of self-worth, we need to feel productive, like we've done something, right? You know what I'm talking about? Especially us men, we are bad about this. We attach our self-worth to our work far more than we should. When you die, your, your job posting will be filled before your obituary is written. Your family, your ministry to them, to the kingdom, is what will last. That is our legacy. Think about that. This is our source of rest and ambition. Because we didn't do a thing to earn God's grace, we can't do a thing to lose it. We can't stop him. So hear me, right? No matter how productive you are in this life, your status as his adopted son, as his adopted daughter, will never change. You are secure. You don't have to earn God's love. You don't have to earn his favor. Because here's the, here's the breaking news. You can't. We can't be good enough. Our good works are as filthy rags, Scripture tells us. You can't earn his favor, and praise God that we don't have to, because working to earn someone's favor is exhausting. You ever try? Some of you, don't, don't elbow your neighbor and say, you know, in-laws or anything like that. Not about that. Earning somebody's favor is exhausting, because they have power over you. If you live for somebody else, you will always come up short. God's agenda is what counts. How do we work for his kingdom? How do we redeem our time? There's a couple more clues in scripture. Look at Ephesians 2.10. It says this. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. There it is. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And in Matthew 5.16, Jesus says this. Let your light shine before others so they may see, oh, there it is again, your good works and give glory to who? To you? To me? To our Father who is in heaven. That phrase, good works, often gets misinterpreted because a lot of people have falsely represented that good works has to be ministry or charity related. And this is where the devil has won something huge by brainwashing us. When we look at the Greek word used here, it's ergon. I don't know if I gave you that. Okay, ergon. It's translated as work, but did you know it can often be translated as task or employment? Well, that changes everything because God, remember in the beginning, created your work to be good. It was perfect prior to the fall. And Jesus just reaffirmed the goodness of what people call secular work. Remember, look at his life. He spent roughly 80% of his adult life likely being a carpenter. Think about that. Before he launched into his three-year ministry, God, according to his word, your work, as long as it is not contrary to his word, your work, even if it's secular, can be considered good, even an act of worship. And you need to hear that. Your work is not in vain. God has called it good, and you are there for a reason. Man, this is for somebody. I don't know who's. Use your sphere of influence that you are currently in to manifest for his kingdom. Maximize the impact you have for Jesus, okay? Somebody got that? All right, that's, that, that is so. As we go about our lives, the work of advancing God's kingdom, we can find practical ways to do that from Scripture. That leads us to our last truth. We can know how God would manage his time. We can know this. We don't have to guess, hope, wonder, or pray about this. We see it in Scripture. When the author of time became flesh, we read that in John 1.14. This is the whole last four weeks of Advent we talked about this. When he came and became flesh, he became fully human. What does that mean? That means he experiences the same junk you do. It means he goes through the same process. He, he had stuff to do. He faced the same challenges. He had the job that he had to get done. Maybe he ran a business. We, did, we know he had a mom and dad to care for we know that hunger was an issue for him. We know he needed to sleep. We see it. Oh, and by the way, he did the same 24-hour limitations that we run up against that stress us out. He had the same constraints that every one of us as human beings had, okay? Don't miss this. As a human being, 
Jesus was challenged to steward his limited time on earth just like you are. He went through the exact same thing. Jesus often talked about work, and he talked about making the most of our time in the Gospels. John 9, 4 says this, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Why? Because night is coming when no one can work. John 17, 4, he says this, I have brought, he's talked to the Father, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. He finished the work. He is the author, the finisher of our faith. And some of you, I know, did you think the same thing I did? Pastor, Jesus didn't have the same distractions we had. It was a different world. How does first century Jerusalem compare to Apex, Cary, Holly Springs, Fuquay today? There's no comparison, Pastor. I don't think, you know, Jesus didn't have email. He didn't have a smartphone. He didn't have a tic-tac, snap a chat, a gram, face tweet, any of that. He, he didn't have the same distractions. Surely it was easier for him to manage his time, right? Don't be fooled. Look closer. We see it time and time again. Jesus was constantly interrupted. He was constantly barraged. He was constantly attacked, having to make choices about his priorities, having to make choices about how to spend his time, having to say no to people who got mad and pouted and took their ball and went home. We see that all the time. This is why Hebrews 4.15 is so powerful. It tells us we don't have a high priest who can't relate to us. We don't have one who's unable to sympathize with all our weaknesses. When it says the word became flesh, y'all, embrace this. This is saying he could sympathize with every one of our weaknesses, including our feeble efforts to redeem our time. All right, so over the next few weeks, here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through several principles of the Gospels that show us very practically how Jesus redeemed his time. Today, I'm going to give you just the first one, and we're done. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and let our instrumentalists come back up. And I'm going to leave you with this first one because it's probably the most important step to redeeming our time. I'm not going to put it on the screen. You have to write it down. You ready? The first step for us, start with the word. Start with the word. To redeem our time in the model of the redeemer, we have to go to the author of time. It's not found in pop psychology. It's not found on the news. It's not found on Oprah. It is found here. When you want to know how the author of time behaved, when you want to know the purposes for the world, when you want to know what he has called you to do with the time he's given us, start with the word. And a lot of people miss this. They're like, oh, I know, but it's head knowledge, Pastor. I'm going to put it back in my car, and I'll, I'll get it next time we come in. The very first thing Jesus did to redeem his time, do you know what he did? He would withdraw and spend time alone with his heavenly father. He would frequently break away from the crowds, even his disciples, and he would sneak away to be alone with the father. All right, so what does that look like for you? Oh, now it gets real. In 2022, here's the first thing we do. We read scripture daily on our own. What does it look like? You read scripture daily on your own. Meditate on it. Think about what you just read. Praying small breath prayers. This is another great one. You don't have, Pastor, I don't have six hours to pray. You don't do that. Pray without ceasing means you literally are praying as you go throughout your day. Lord, I hear that ambulance going by. I pray for that person. Whoever they need, whatever, I pray you supply it according to your riches and glory. If they're in pain, please take them out of pain. If they're fearful, I pray you would whisper peace to their heart right now. One day that'll be us. <laughs> Needing the ambulance, right? It's a breath prayer. You're at the cashier. You see that lady in front of you. She's struggling. She, Lord, I pray you would bless them today. You know what? You want me to be able to. I'm going to buy their groceries. It's a breath prayer, right? You do that all throughout the day. Before you know it, guess what you've done? You've prayed all day long. It's a breath prayer. A prayer that could be said within the exhalation of one breath. And you're in communion with the Father. How does it look like? Regularly observing the Sabbath. Calling that time out that we're commanded to do, right? It's your ticket to rest. And we're going to talk about that and what that really means coming up. How does it look like with Jesus? Plugging into a small group. You want to talk about a practical thing? That one hour will pay more dividends than probably anything else you can talk and you can relate and you plow into the scriptures. It pays such huge dividends. Remember, spending time with God this year does not have to be fancy. You don't have to learn Hebrew and Greek and Koine and Aramaic and spend three hours in the morning with a yarmulke on or anything. Just carve out time. Dig into the scripture and see what God has to say about how you're supposed to spend your days. Don't take my word for it. Right? You get to go to the source. Hear it from this. We're commanded to redeem our time. Because the days are evil. 
Do you know that? Can you look around? Can you sense it? The world needs your light more than ever. The days are evil. Time is fleeting for us to do the will of the Lord. And our aim is to redeem the time. It's imperative that we start with the word. I read just this week about a chaplain who offered a New Testament to a soldier. He came up and he gave it to the soldier. And the soldier's response shocked him. So audacious. True story. The chapel was stunned. Almost didn't know what to say. Evidently, the texture of the New Testaments that the army chaplain was giving out made perfect for tearing out and rolling up cigarettes for that regiment. And it was a common thing. The chaplain at least thought clearly enough quickly. He said, before you do that, would you at least promise me that you will read the page that you tear out before you light it up? He wouldn't agree. He didn't know what would happen. Chaplain goes away, comes back two months later to check on him. And that soldier has died. They give the New Testament back to the chaplain. And he opens it and he's stunned. You ready for this? He opens the Bible and he sees only the first couple pages have been torn out. The rest of the Bible is in great shape. In fact, as he looks close, he sees stains on each page. This Bible has been well read in just two months. Right as he's fixing to close it, he sees something in the front and he opens the cover and here is the quote. He finds these words. Here is a book which I once despised and then I read it. And in it, I found salvation in Jesus. You want to know your purpose? You want 22 to have a different feel than last year? It starts with the word. You plug in. We redeem the time. You have to spend time with the author of time to know the purpose for you. To know why we are called to, to live these days. Why are we here for such a time as this? So today, I want to give you a few minutes to do would you bow with me as we pray? Father, as we take a moment to bow before you, as we shortly open this altar, we know that your word tells us the days are evil and time is fleeting. Help us to take your word seriously. This year, God, I pray that it would burn in our hearts, that we would protect that time. We would carve it out, even if it's just a few minutes, to see what you have to say to us. To let our breath prayers be more than a monologue, but a dialogue where we pause. And we listen to what you have to speak to us. God, I thank you for your promise that we have peace first before we do anything else. That you are the one who has saved us. You give us the agenda. You are the commander. Thank you that everything we do after we get that peace is a response to your love. Use us this year, God. Make any difference. Send revival to our land. Begin with us. We are yielded. We are humble. We are still before you. In Jesus' name, amen.